This is the book Winchy, Mission Stories of Colin and Melva Winch by S. Ross Goldstone. The true adventures of missionary pilots and nurses in the South Pacific, as retold to the children of Watertown SDA Church. I'm your storyteller, Austin Backus. Let's go. This week's story, the chapter is called The Drop. Sumumuni was a small village of approximately 100 people in the western Sepik, approximately 20 miles from the West Aryan border. Situated on flat land alongside a rushing mountain stream adjacent to bushclad mountains, it had been recently opened to the Adventist Church. A small school with a national teacher in charge had been established. Colin was familiar with Sumumuni, having spent two days hiking into it on a previous occasion. He knew he didn't have an airstrip, but he had noted a school playing field. As welfare supplies became available, these were flown out by plane and dropped to the, to the various villages. One of these airdrops was scheduled for the Sumumuni playing field. The teacher was alerted of the date and asked to notify all the village inhabitants to stay indoors to avoid the risk of getting hurt by the 65-pound bags dropping out of the sky. The door on the passenger side of the plane was removed, and Mission President Elwyn Rathel was strapped into the ventilated seat. Colin gave careful instructions as to the procedure. Each bag was to be ejected from the plane at the precise moment that he said, Drop! Recipient village names were written on the bags, which were then stored for easy access in the rear of the passenger seat. On this occasion, Sumamuni was to receive three of these bags containing clothing and bars of soap. Lord, today we fly to the villages to drop these bags of clothing. They prayed before taking off. Please may your protecting hand be on us as we fly and bring us safely home again, we pray. Shortly after takeoff, Colin was circling the playing field at Sumamuni, throttling the engine to let the villagers know the Adventist plane had arrived. He took note of the ground surface, checked the wind direction and velocity, and determined that when he came opposite an outdoor toilet building, he would call for the drop. As Colin flew the plane toward the designated spot, losing altitude until it was only a few feet above ground level, Elwin reached for the first bag labeled Sumamuni and positioned it at the door opening. Drop, called Colin, and the bag of clothing and soap went tumbling to the ground. Bouncing a couple more times, it cartwheeled across the surface of the playing field in the slipstream of the plane. Colin gave the plane full throttle and climbed skyward in preparation for the next drop. A local teenage boy who had been under the school building dashed out, picked up the bag, and ran back with it to the school. Colin began his approach once more. <clears throat> Wings flapped down to slow the plane. Drop! And the second bag spiraled earthward. Again, the young man ran out to retrieve the bag. Dressed only in a pair of shorts, his ebony skin glistened in the sunlight as he effortlessly lifted the bag and delivered it to the teacher's house. Female students had been watching through the school windows. Seeking to impress, the young warrior looked up and said, You pella marry ya look look good. Buy me kiss some this pella big. Meaning, you girls watch now. I'm going to catch this next bag. Impressed with the traditional shake of their hand, they replied, You want pella man true? You are truly a brave man. Colin knew nothing about this plan, and on the third approach, flew a little higher. On each approach, he had been flying at high nose altitude, meaning the plane's nose was elevated, obscuring his vision of point of impact as the bags hit the ground. However, as he tilted the plane to make it easier for the bag to be pushed from the open door, Elwin observed that the young man had run onto the playing field and was positioning himself directly under the flight path of the plane. There he stood with outstretched arms, waiting to catch the bag. Drop! The bag hurtled earthward straight into the chest of the warrior. Crashing to the ground, he was somersaulted backward in the wake of the plane, still clutching the bag. There he lay, spread eagle, and not moving. The girls, together with their teacher, ran out and surrounded him. Oi, you one pelamen true! You are truly a brave man! The young warrior didn't move, nor did he respond. He was unconscious. Someone ran for a bucket, and dipping it in the river, filled it with water, and doused the wounded warrior's face. Slowly he regained consciousness. With blurred vision, he noted the ring of anxious eyes looking down at him. As his wits returned, he exclaimed, Now me savvy true. Behind me no can walk him, this bella came senting. I have learned my lesson. I will never try that again. Given the details of the story on a later visit to the village, Alwyn chuckled over the incident until the day of his death. So the next one is called Another Perspective. This is a comment or a sidebar by Alwyn Campbell, a missionary educator. He's been mentioned earlier in the book. Colin was one of the pilots flying for the church when I was headmaster of our Nagam school, 40 miles south of Wewak. Occasionally, he would fly over the school to say hello by working the throttle and dipping the wings. Sometimes he would deliver an express delivery message by throwing out the window a note wrapped around a pebble. We certainly wouldn't mind the interruption to our regular classroom activities. There'd be a sudden mass exodus from the classroom, accompanied by much excitement and yelling. We all loved our mission plane. On one occasion, Colin and his family paid us a visit in the bush of Nagam. 
in our large school gardens, we happen to have a good supply of beautiful sweet corn ready to be harvested. Edna cooked a goodly supply of delicious corn cobs and served them up on a large dish on the dining room table together with other good food. Our good pilot friend took a liking to this delicacy and really made himself at home. In order to cover up his overindulgence, he surreptitiously slipped two empty corn cobs onto his neighbor's empty plate in order to give the impression of he, Colin, being a self-controlled gentleman. He did have a wicked sense of humor. This chapter is entitled, To Go or Not to Go. When expatriate missionaries from the Pacific Islands get together to share memories, the conversation may sometimes include toilet stories. Living in the homeland with modern flush conveniences, one might have little comprehension of the primitive facilities and sometimes total lack of facilities that existed in the mission field. Expatriate missionaries from Western backgrounds tend to be private in certain aspects of daily functions. They like to shower privately, dress privately, and eliminate their body waste privately. This may create problems in remote mission outposts and sometimes in not-so-remote locations as well. One faces a major adjustment in values or put up with great discomfort as one resists the call of nature in the presence of curious onlookers. Children of any ethnic background are inquisitive creatures, and those living in the islands of the South Pacific are no exception. When faced with adults of a different race, color, and style of dress, natural curiosity is intensified. Questions race through their young minds. What do they eat? Why do they dress different to us? What do they look like when they don't wear those clothes? Do they go to the toilet the same as we do? Colin Ray calls a toilet on an island in the Gilbert Islands. The building itself had been built on stilts out in the lagoon and was reached by a long, slender coconut palm which had been felled and reached from the shore out to the toilet. As one cautiously made one's way along the palm, endeavoring not to fall into the lagoon, the palm would begin to bounce rhythmically, causing the toilet building to rock backwards and forwards. If one needed urgent relief, the crossing became all the more hazardous. At least it was a successful warning device to anyone seated in the toilet. On arrival in the toilet building, one could have the choice of five holes cut through a long plank suspended above the lagoon. It was a family-sized toilet and frequently used that way. The embarrassment came when Colin noted that all the children in the village became aware that an event of some significance was about to take place. They sat on the beach awaiting the inevitable as he cautiously but very publicly made his way across the felled coconut palm to the very conspicuous outhouse. In spite of calls from the parents to come away, the children remained to satisfy their curiosity as to whether the white man went to the toilet just like them. No wonder expatriates tended to wait until darkness to make the hazardous journey to answer nature's call, but to do so increased the risk of an unexpected dip in the lagoon, because crossing the palm trunk bridge with a lantern in one hand and a toilet roll in the other was even more hazardous than in the daytime. During the time the Winch family was at Boliu, another incident took place which brought embarrassment to Colin. Because of the coral makeup of the ground, it was not possible to dig pit toilets. The principal's house and outhouse were in full view of the girls' dormitory, and consequently every effort was made to answer nature's call in the darkness of night. Even then, a lamp needed to be carried, lest one would step upon a toad or a snake, which frequented the white coral line paths. As an answer to the local situation, a large drum was used to catch and store the fluid, and this proved a satisfactory solution, until one day when the container needed to be emptied out. Having arduously dug a hole to bury the waste, Colin lifted the rusting heavy drum from his position, and hugging it to his chest, he made his way toward the hole. In full view of the girls, he heard giggling and sniggering as they peered out the windows, all of them knowing full well what was in that drum he was carrying. It became even more apparent when Colin stubbed his foot on a coral outcrop. As he stumbled, he squeezed the drum even harder, and it burst, with the contents showering all over him. Gales of laughter from the girls' dormitory followed Colin as he made a dash for the basement shower, where he endeavored to thoroughly remove the offending contents of the drum. Nonetheless, Colin was not welcome in the house that night due to an offending odor that was difficult to get rid of. On another occasion, Colin had preached a Sabbath service to a large outdoor audience at a Kainantu district meeting when nature started to call. However, all the congregation had to shake hands with the big man from Lae, so after the last of more than a thousand hands shook, he made a hurried trip across the playing field to a makeshift leaf and grass toilet. On entering and seeing it was a squat toilet, he decided to take his trousers off and hang them on a twig. All of a sudden, he felt the floor start to give way and then a loud crack. He made a grab for the bush wall, but to no avail. He found himself down in the pit below, trying to keep his shoes out of the mess. Looking up, all he could see was a mass of women's faces, all chanting, Sorry, Master! Sorry, Master! Some strong men appeared and pulled him to solid ground. One of the older women saw his predicament and handed him a lap lap, a loincloth that most island women wear instead of an underskirt. Colin's trip to the creek was even faster than it had been to the little house, and someone found him to deliver his salvaged trousers. A similar thing happened on another occasion. This time a major part of the floor dropped into the pit, but the roof of the toilet collapsed around his ears. So he ended up in the pit, covered in leaves and other bush toilet construction materials. In 1970, the Winch family was resident in Lae. As dawn was breaking, the family gathered for an early worship and breakfast before Colin was to commence an early flight. 
As they sat around the table, they heard a scuffle outside and raced to the window to see what was the cause. They saw the barefooted National Night Soil Man with two full pans connected to a pole supported on his shoulder. He had collected the pans from the toilets of the President and the Winch family. In the process of making his way to the night cart, he had been attacked by Kimi, the Winch family's little dog. The poor man was dancing in circles, trying to protect himself from being bitten. Little dogs have a habit of sneaking up behind the, nipping the heels of their victim. Kimi was no exception. The Winch children called out to the victim, Just stand still, he won't hurt you, we will call him. The poor fellow responded, You think him pussycat? Him no pussycat, him puppy dog. The children with laps and laughter with a still frightened man making his exit from the property with Kimi hot on his heels. In vain, the children called the dog. It seemed Kimi was having too much fun. Toilets on the ground created one type of hazard, but when the call of nature occurs while one is in the midst of a flight of a mission plane, logistically, the problem takes on a whole new dimension. On one occasion, Colin was transporting a boarding school teacher from Goroka to Mount Hagen. While flying in the beautiful Wagi Valley, the teacher informed Colin he needed to go to the toilet. Colin assured him they'd be at Mount Hagen within 15 minutes and there was a toilet there. The teacher could not wait that long and insisted they land immediately. Fortunately, there were a number of airstrips along the valley, so Colin obliged by making his approach to the Bonds Strip. Can't you hurry the landing? queried the distressed passenger, but there was a procedure to be followed. Colin notified air control of his change of plans and circled the airstrip to make sure it was clear of other planes and any local woman walking along the center of the strip carrying firewood, yams, and a piccanini child on her head. After all, cleared land makes for easier walking as well for landing of aircraft. He then landed the plane. Stop! Stop immediately! demanded the passenger. It was obvious an embarrassing accident was about to happen. Before the plane was at a complete standstill, the passenger leaped out of the plane and dashed off into the kunai grass, reappearing later with a much relieved look on his face. Flights of longer duration over oceans needed a different solution. When Colin was flying the twin-engine J.L. Tucker over the western and central Pacific area, flights could take as long as six hours between landing places. Sensing a possible problem, Colin contacted supply firms in America. He received a letter from one firm assuring him they had the perfect solution. It consisted of a funnel with a stopper attached to a long tube that could be fed through a floor vent in the plane to empty the waste underneath and outside the aeroplane. Then one morning... Colin was mixing powdered milk from an almost empty three-pound milk tin when it occurred to him this empty container would make an ideal receptacle for solid waste. It could even double as a sick bag. Pleased with his thinking, he placed the container under the rear passenger seat. On a four-hour flight from Honiara to Nauru, Colin had a Union mission officer on board. Halfway through the flight, the passenger tapped Colin on the shoulder and informed him he needed to answer nature's call. No problem. Just feel under your seat. You'll find the necessary container, said Colin. The passenger reached under his seat and pulled out a life jacket. A second effort resulted in another life jacket. His third effort brought out the milk tin. Uh, you don't mean this, do you? Asked the incredulous passenger, noting the confined space within the cabin of the plane. Yep, that's it, was the answer. The passenger decided to hold on until the plane landed in Nauru. He then half walked and half ran with the most unusual gait, past the waiting immigration, health and customs authorities, straight to the men's toilet. Only Colin's explanation of the emergency pacified the startled authorities. Be sure to tune in next time for more stories from the book Winchy by S. Ross Goldstone which is available at the Adventist Book Center. And meanwhile, check out these videos and others on my channel with many more mission stories and Bible skits for kids and adults. God bless you.